Okay. All right. So is the code visible for everyone? Yeah. I can have it. Oh, is it better? OK. <laughs> so thank you all for coming today. I know it's Valentine's Day, so I just didn't want to break the cycle of two every two weeks an event. So thank you very much. Um, you don't have to say it. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so uh, just to set some expectations, I'm probably not the person, I'm possibly not the best person to talk about Docker. I'm new to it. And I'm just going to demonstrate uh, a basic flow that you can use to have your tests. I mean, I'm using Cucumber here, but you can easily use whatever script or whatever uh, framework that you want um, to have a Docker image that will host your tests. And when you run that image, you can easily execute your tests. So I have built a simple test suite, which will have a feature file it will simply go to Google, and then it will go to Swagger for uh, service testing. So this is going to be a UI test. This is going to be a te uh, service test. And uh, this project is also in our uh, GitHub account test type, so you can easily pull it and modify it yourselves. Some, some tools, or not, some features that we have in this thing is like if, if a scenario fails it, it will automatically capture a screenshot if it is a GUI test so if it's a service test it's not going to record a screenshot if it's a GUI test uh, it, it's going to include a screenshot in the report that it's going to generate so we're going to see that as well uh, what I have done for this project is I practically use the official Ruby released, which is 2.2.6 from Docker. So uh, this is available to everyone. You can easily um, open it yourself and run your tests. Uh, the reason I have used 2.2 uh, version of Ruby is that it had some issues with Selenium Web Driver while I was inst installing, and I didn't want to uh, like I didn't want to spend too much time on it. So I used a compatible version with 2.2. 226. I also didn't go, go for for the uh, slim versions of these uh, images, so it's not a, a Alpine release or it's not a slim Ruby release. It's a full born Ruby release. So the uh, size of the images, I think it's a bit over one gigs, but you have to download this once. So once you download it, then every time you run it, will use the cache. So it's not a big problem. Uh, the reason for me to do this was basically I like to code in Ruby. I like Cucamera and Capybara a lot. I find them extremely easy to code. I find them extremely versatile and very maintainable. I really don't like to code in Java uh, to do the Selenium tests and Capybara itself has many advantages over se pure Selenium. So that's why I, I wanted to have a way where I can write the tests myself and if somebody wanted to like pull this project and run the uh, test locally, it would be so easy as just running a command line argument. And it also can be deployed in a continuous integration or continuous delivery environment so that the tests run in a pipeline easily. So the reason for me was that uh, all the tests are run in the cont uh, uh, container itself. So there's no external dependency. You don't have to have anything installed in your uh, machine other than Docker. So yeah, it's just a one, one click uh, run. So what we have done. Um, again, I have used the template image of uh, Ruby 226 from uh, Docker. And then uh, I just run this command make the app, make directory app. And then work directory app is uh, telling Docker that I'm going to be using this default directory here and then uh, I run a gem update which ensures me that uh, because Ruby uh, Ruby uh, template of 226 image comes from some gems itself so I'm just ensuring if they are out of date I'm just updating them and then 
our project has a gem file, uh, which just shows us our project dependencies. Uh, I upload that, yeah, I upload that gem file under my project directory with with the log file, so that if if uh, I, I want to make sure that the version of gems uh, I'm using locally in my machine are the same with the uh, image, so that there are no conflicts or, or no there are no version differences. I add those into the image. And then I just do a bundle install so that my uh, project dependencies are installed. Then I <clears throat> aptitude get is the uh, package installer for Ubuntu. First I update them and then I install two uh, dependencies for uh, my projects to run. Ice Weasel is the name for Firefox in Linux. Uh, or Debian, I don't know, it's not Linux, it's De Debian, I think. And then XWFB is the uh, frame buffer that we are going to use for our GUI test to run. Believe me, it was a pain to get this first going because I don't know if you have seen my mails through the soft software dev, so I, I, I got a lot of help from thought workers as well. Because uh, first of all, you, you need a frame buffer to run your GUI-based test. If you don't have it, you have to either point your uh, GUI-based uh, things to your local frame buffer or uh, you can't <laughs> basically exactly <laughs> yeah. so that's why you need the a frame buffer and then um, this is the part I'm not very happy with uh, this is a static uh, naming of the gecko driver version uh, which I set uh, environment variable in the uh, operating system of uh, the docker image saying that I'm going to be using the uh, 0 0.14 of the gecko driver version uh, now, if it was Chrome, it was very easy to get the Chrome driver's latest uh, version because they have a link in their website saying that if you say slash latest, it just gives you a, a text containing the latest, latest version and then you can use that dynamically. But I'm not aware of any uh, ways to do this, do this for Firefox uh, Gecko driver, so I have to put it manually. I'm sure that there's a better way to do this, so anybody. I'm open for suggestions. <clears throat> After that, uh, I just, again, make a directory for the download of the Gecko driver. And then I've used wget to get the specific version that I tell in here for Gecko driver to download. Now, Gecko driver is the latest uh, driver that you have to use for Selenium with Firefox. Previously, you didn't need any other driver. It, 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 it was just included with the Selenium web driver. Um, now you have to use this Gecko driver. Uh, in, in Google, a lot of sites uh, have this code in, what was the other getter for Linux? Curl, sorry, yeah, curl. Uh, a, a lot of uh, websites have curl in this command. I really couldn't get that to work because it would just connect and it would just did, did not download my uh, packages. Maybe it was because uh, I was working out uh, client side and there was some proxy issues. I don't know. So uh, wget was easy enough. And then uh, I opened that uh, to a destination like... I first download it into temp here, and then I open it into the folder that I have created in the previous lines. So now in this opt slash gecko driver folder, I have the executable that I'm going to use as gecko driver. And then I remove the uh, tar file that I have downloaded just for <laughs> space saving <laughs> purposes. And then I make the Gecko driver executable here, and it will. The last line is for linking the Gecko driver to the bin folder, so that I don't have to modify the path. Uh, any questions up until here? Or is it? Do you want to get the latest <coughs> Gecko driver version? Wouldn't it be safer anyways in all the versions? 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, it, it's easier. Yeah, in terms of con compatibility, it's definitely easier. But like, I would really be happy if I knew some way to do getting the latest driver without writing something in because it's just a magic spring now. So I have to change it manually. I think there are ways to make it uh, like pass this as a parameter when I run the uh, uh, Docker file anyway. So, but yeah, this is the first thing that we do. I did. Right. So what we have done is we have installed our gems. We have inst updated our gems. We have uh, installed our packages that are needed to run. And then we have just downloaded the Gecko driver. Uh, again, in in the uh, in the web, you can easily find the versions of doing this with Chrome. But in in terms of keeping this a little bit smaller, because when you install Chrome and Chrome driver, the uh, size of the image grows. So I just did it with Firefox. All right. So after this line. All I do is I add the features folder up to my uh, project directory. And then uh, the way that I made this run is it has two levels, actually. Uh, one is this Cucumber command that SH, SH. That ena enables me to write the Cucumber command uh, from outside so that I might want to run them in a different manner, uh, some other in some other RAM. I upload that um, shell file to the image, and then I make that executable. And this last line is the line where I execute the command here. So this command is firstly, it runs a frame buffer server here with the arguments of, for example, resolution. Uh, screen number zero, the first screen that we have in the uh, operating system of that Docker image, and resolution of that screen. And then when you uh, write this run command, you can uh, queue it or pipe it with a different command called run cucumber command that sh sh. So what it will do is it will just fire up the uh, frame buffer server, and then on that server it will execute that this command. So what does that command have? Let's see. It has just like cucumber features format pretty so that I print out the format into the command line as well as the uh, report.html. Uh, and then if, if let's say for example if you had if you wanted to run not all feature features under your features uh, folder, but you want to uh, specifically run just the regression, for example, you would just come in and just change this file and it will do that. After this one, now, sorry. Now, this is, this is all we have uh, in our Docker file. When I run this Docker image, it will automatically come to this point and execute the commands in this uh, cucumber command that sh. So in order to run all this, I have also created a second uh, shell script saying docker build tagged uh, long lost cukes template. This is my uh, docker, docker username and project. And then docker run cukes template, this docker file that we have just checked out. And then Docker copy, copy, this Docker PSLQ gives you the latest container that was run. And then it gives you the ID of that container. You add that ID in here and say, from that container, pick up that uh, docker-html-report-html thing and put it under the folder that I'm working as the host system. So what it does is, it fires up the frame buffer, it executes, it executes the cucumber command that sh, and that cucumber uh, command has some HTML reports defined in it. Uh, after its execution is completed, it picks up that HTML report and puts it outside of the container so that you can access it locally. So 
that's basically it. Um, any things you would like to ask here? All right, let's run it. Now I, I'm just going to run the test uh, first manually here in my uh, local machine. I'm just going to add Yeah, the test has passed. It's, uh, what the test was doing is basically, I visit Google homepage. It just visits Google, which is set as my default homepage here. So it's google.com. And then it just finds the uh, LST dash IB fields, which I'm guessing is the search fields. No, no, this is this is just my first local run. So I just wanted to show, yeah, this is the LST dash IB. This is the search text field. So it just checks if it is there. And then the second test goes to uh, petstore.swagger.io, uh, find by status. Uh, you can use this uh, service to test your services. It's pretty neat. It just has lots of uh, functions that you can use, like get, put, up, uh, get, put, post, delete, whatever. So it just hits there, just makes a get request, and then prints the response and parses the result here. So let's run this again because Firefox opened in background. Yep, again, they failed. Uh, it automatically generates its HTML report anyway, so let's check it. Uh, there are just two field, uh, two tests, and they both pass. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce a bug here, and then uh, just see if it takes a screenshot. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I just wrote an RSpec statement that 4 should equal 5, which will obviously fail. And then uh, because it's in this GUI uh, mode, GUI test, it will produce a screenshot of Google at that point. So let's run it again. Now we have a failing test. Let's check our HTML report again. Yep, we have the failure here. And then here, if we click this, you can see the screenshot of uh, your web browser at that point. This feature is actually, actually very useful uh, because previously what I used to do is like produce some screenshots give them some timestamps like scenario names and try to go through them one by one, which one is the failure. This this method just directly embeds it into your HTML report and you can just access it from here. So yeah, our tests are working locally. Let's see what they do in the Docker. I'm just going to run this one. Just one sim simple uh, shell script. 
So because I have done this previously, it uh, runs through all the uh, steps very fast. But if you'd like me to do so, I can run this without cache and see it download all the packages, download all the <laughs> images. But that would take a few minutes. So I don't know if you want me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, the same scenario here. Two scenarios, one failed, one passed. And let's check this Docker HTML report. So, so let's do one thing here. Instead of just writing it here, let's just set it by <laughs> Let's run this Docker file again. That Ruby then is actually given. Is that meant to be like Which one? The, the one I'm looking at right now. Like given thing. Given yeah. yeah, that's Ruby and Capybara. Uh, well, actually, it has a few components here. Visit is a RSpec uh, component, which was with a, a page, and then find by ID is Capybara's thing uh, to find an element on web page. Time dot now is Ruby, uh, and this should again is from RSpec. So it like th this is why I prefer this over others because. You are not uh, concerned with any programming details. You are not concerned with any things. I know it's very frustrating for some developers because it's not like um, type safe and it's not very static. But I don't know. It's it just like feels more natural language to me. All right. So let's check our Docker image again. Sorry, HTML report again. So yeah, I have just put in uh, the now thing from Ruby. So this is the sc screenshot that it produces. So yeah, uh, that is basically it. <laughs> I mean, if uh, again, as I said, this project is already in our uh, GitLab account. So if you just pull it, and then if you write your feature files and step definitions in it, you can easily uh, run it yourself and see try a few tests yourself. So what was it that inspired you to want to Dockerize this? Sort of yeah, the, the first thing I said, like, uh, in order to uh, let people run your tests uh, with the Ruby stuff that you have been using, uh, you have to make them install Ruby and then the gems and all dependencies that you have. If you do it this way, then you will you can just easily say just download the project and then uh, Docker test run that sh just execute that. So everybody's thoughts is like I don't want to do it. The thing is like every project that I have been into, uh, they all start as like we are all gonna make all developers write all the tests and we're gonna do it in Java, C sharp, whatever language that we are using. If, if it's not a Ruby project that we are going in, it's very hard to convince people to write your, their tests in Ruby, which is understandable. But uh, if the tests are being maintained by the people who are writing them, then it's very easy. But again, like uh, being a tester and being written in many languages, this is the one that I find the most comfortable. That's why I always write my tests in Ruby uh, if it's a web application. What's the average length of your like continuous integration build time? Oh, uh, that depends on from project to project. But let's say, are you asking the test time or I'm the? Just, well, I'm just thinking it's been in the Docker container for significantly all time. It it does like it does. If you if you're not using it, uh, I would say efficiently and then cache it properly, mm -hmm. it it will take a lot of minutes. But uh, to be honest, most of our projects we use Docker anyways. So we we do uh, have that wait time, uh, regardless. But again, the ma the main idea maybe uh, even if you don't put this into your uh, continuous pipeline, you can easily 
pull it from your project repository and run locally. And because, because devs are going to want to run their tests before committing into the code itself, it would be more comfortable to, for them to pull it, run it, deploy it. And once you run it one time, you will you will have cached it, cached it, so you will not have to wait that huge time again. I suppose it has many other benefits of like as well, like the, like the Ruby or something, uh, you just do it once in a Docker file, yeah. and then it runs on all the machines, you don't have to update 10 Jenkins slaves or something. Exactly, like exactly. Like I said, I'm very new to this stuff as well, so I do want to have a look at uh, Compose and Swarm. So I'm, I'm uh, planning to expand this on parallelization so that when I want to run tests in parallel, just uh, swarm it and then run, I don't know, in 10 uh, images, like one feature file for all. So it would uh, decrease the testing time significantly. Can you, and I've used Selenium Grid before, where yeah. you, have, you can say one machine can yeah. have 10 instances of yep. the browser at the same yeah. time. Can you do that inside the Docker container as well? Uh, you can do that, but that wouldn't be very efficient because Docker containers are going to be lesser in power in your, uh, than your machines. But Cucumber has that feature as well. You have parallel test gem. Uh, you can run your Cucumber test in parallel one machine like N tests. But uh, the reason I want to do this in different Docker machines is first, it will be more sterile. It will not be affected by the other feature files or, or run. And it will, it, well, it's more in a isolated way for every feature file to run so that's why and again maybe it won't be that efficient of running in a single machine and 10 instances but it's very good always good to experiment so <laughs> I suppose the advantage is it frees the developer up to write these sort of tests and whatever exactly yeah definitely how does this uh i've used some but the company i used it with they we got a lot of false negatives just mm. failing for reasons that you know, the application was broken because of the actual Selenium. It probably wasn't well written for Selenium. Yeah. Test, but, you, know, but, um, you had to rely quite heavily on certain occasions on like just waiting for a second if you got a bit of um, mm. I don't know if uh, this isn't really a Docker question, but I don't, I don't know how this compares in that, yeah. in that respect to like, things like CasperJS. That's uh, CasperJS I haven't used personally yeah. in production, but like. Uh, Copybara's advantage over Selenium is, uh, the first advantage is that. Copybara does this uh, by itself out of the box, so you don't have to worry about dynamic waiting or you don't have to put sleeps everywhere. You can easily, for example, in our environment thing, we have this 10 seconds wait time, default max wait time. So if you say, for example, I, I have written that fine by ID, right? If that text field wasn't there, Copybara would uh, wait for 10 seconds by default for that to appear. If after 10 seconds it's not still there, then it will fail the tests. So it, it already has dynamic waiting built inside it. You don't have to change it. You can easily go in your code and say, okay, for this find, I don't want you to wait the default 10 seconds time. I just want you to wait for three seconds time. So it will just wait for three seconds. For that DOM element. For that DOM element, yeah. So, so this is this is this is basically the first advantage over Selenium. It it really handles it greatly, and it ha it has so many DSL elements that you can use. For example, wait finds uh, page should have this element. This element should be there. Like this element should contain that element. A lot lots of matches and finders. So you really have to just write your uh, sentences, and it will take care of it. Uh, the Java Selenium does most of the same things as well. Yeah, it, it does, but like you have to configure them like yeah, very, uh, how should I say, like it doesn't have too many implicit weights as this one. It has, exp you can use explicit weights. I can do the same thing where it will wait 10 seconds. You can set that yeah, you can set that. Well, what I'm saying is that uh, you have to set that somewhere. Like this, this comes out of the box. If I didn't set this 10 seconds, for example, I don't know what the default time is, but it has something. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Did you uh, consider uh, using a provisioning tool like uh, Ansible or Chef instead of Docker? Uh, well, yeah, we have done that as well, but in this really, I wanted to learn Docker. 
So this this didn't come out of a necessity that I had to do. This kind of came out of a project that like, what if I do this? What if I play that? So you can use yeah, uh, puppet scripts like Chef, Ansible's. Uh, they will all they would all work. Yeah. Using the Ruby base of it's minimal head of overhead of that. Yeah. And I actually want to refine that as well. I will really want to try what the Alpine uh, release doesn't have that I need or the slim version doesn't have that I need. So maybe I can cut down a lot from that uh, base big image as well. I have a more general question. Sure, sure. If, uh, if you do any sort of tests and you want to you want to try and almost decouple yourself away from the DOM structure because you can't uh, mm. not have that change. What is your strategy? So the question is, so, you, I so, don't. You know, you want to write tests that you know you can have your front end developers go away and you know changing each other as they like, but obviously you've got to be changing your tests. Yeah. Like that. But what's the what's your way of minimizing that? So uh, if a DOM element changes, like the uh, accessor that we have, an ID, a class, an attribute changes, then we have to change our test to uh, see that. But the way I do it, for example, instead of writing your uh, DOM elements identifiers here, I tend to have an external file that will define, for example, search uh, page and search page uh, text field. And then it will have an identifier against that. If somebody changes that identifier, I just go and change that file, and then uh, the tests are not uh, changed at all. So you haven't got your foot in for example, for any particular classes just for your foot in We do have that too. Yeah, uh, because this is an activity that we do from the start, like we always pair with developers, we actually uh, force a convention that we have and then let them know we would like to have this or if they are changing it, please let us know because we will have to change our test. So it's a communication thing. We always work hand to hand with them and set the expectation that tests are using some specific thing. So please try to adhere to that. Like, there are times where we go to devs and ask for new classes, for example, to be added just for our test cases, just for our testing purposes. So that happens too. One of the interesting tactics around this that I've heard is to use the, uh, the alt tags on DOM elements to, to select them because uh, that also gives you the secondary benefit of uh, to being accessibility enabled. And oh, yeah. Those things tend not to change as often. Like if you have an element that's like submit button, you may change the class or the ID of it, but likely the alt text will remain the same. I suppose that falls down if it's multilingual. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Maybe yeah, maybe maybe if you load them from like various language files and then they're they're swamped basically. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, One golden rule is that we never use expats because that's very <laughs> fragile. And we never do. We, we really literally go and choke devs. Please put something here. We we, are, we won't be using ex expats. So we had a lot, a lot of expats. Yeah. Um, particularly for tables, like getting the third row and left it element. Yeah. It was for tabular data. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but <coughs> it got to the point where some of the other Everything has to have an ID. How good of a function tests are is directly related to how specific the selectors are. I think yeah, it's, it's ideal for working with developers. Places that I've worked to have that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, at that time, I would always advise using a repository that shows like which thing which things are being used in which pages mm -hmm. so if somebody changes that you go and check it out if you're in that situation then you've always got to check your tests and make sure the bail hasn't been there which is quite frustrating but you, you mean you can't put it in like a, you can't really put it in a ci pipeline well yeah um, but yeah actually but yeah i suppose it was if you work with port works mm -hmm. i don't suppose they do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't be so sure <laughs> is it recording no i didn't say that <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. Well, one approach that I always use is like, again, uh, because I have used find by ID here, it has to be an ID. But for example, I could have easily uh, written find uh, text. 
fields, sorry, let's not write text field selector. Let's say that we have a hash, and then from that hash, I get my text field attribute. Sorry. All right. So what I would do is, for example, let's put it in here. What should we call it? Data.rb. Um, where's my dollar? Yep. Uh, search page selectors. Equals. So what I will have here is, for example, what was the name? Text field. We'll have a value of uh, LSD dash ID. So now this is an ID because it has a hash. Uh, what I will do here is that find uh, dollar. This is the global uh, variable thing in Ruby. Um, was it search page selectors? Right? Yeah, search page selectors. So because I have this now, I don't have to change the test if the selector changes. Let's say if had an ID previously, now it doesn't, and it has a class called something. I would just go there and change this into something, and the test would pass. So this is one way that I have used previously to, let's see if it works. <laughs> well, there are many good headless browsers like Phantom GS, but I tend to not use headless browsers just because headless browser is not a browser that people use. And if you find some bugs in headless browser, it might be the case that they are not present in the real browser or vice versa. So I really do want to go with uh, Headly, Headful <laughs> <laughs> browsers. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it got passed. It failed because we written this here. So it did find it. And the uh, reports should show it as well. Yeah. It went to Google and put in the text field. So this approach really worked in an environment where the selectors were constantly changing and the communication was not good. So people had to go and check them. This is one thing that I used. I've seen the, the, the page object model thing which they talk about, which is supposedly. Yeah. Uh, I can do it, but then some people seem to be suggesting that you put loads of things in there. So if you, instead of saying, once you've got the element and then doing the stuff with the element, you have methods in your page object which will say set the text field. Yes. Or if you've got a table in there that's got defined headers, it might be get yeah, his age. Yeah. And it knows that the age is the third column. Yes. That is also useful. I, I do use page object model, but I don't use it with Cucumber because when I have Cucumber and Capybara, if I use a page object model as well, then that's a three level uh, complexity. If I have this expressive way of saying things, for example, I visit Google, I, I for example, update a client, I, I don't know, log into the system, then I really don't need that much of a page object to write, as you say, the methods, the, I don't know, data, data attributes that. It's just expressive with Capybara, it's so easy. Like you find this and then fill it, just that. So. If I use page object model, I don't use Cucumber. So there's that and that I do. I 
principles for workforce situations like that? Uh, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we've, we've tried doing, luckily, well, luckily or not, the application that we're testing stores its screens. They're not, they end up as HTML, but they're stored as XML. Hmm. And then they get translated. So we can generate the page objects from the screens. Hmm. So that you don't have the problem where the ID, if the IDs change, then yeah. you just regenerate all the screens. Yeah. So it means that the, because most of our testers aren't technical at all, mm -hmm. um, but they can then write, because instead of having to find it by the yeah, ID yeah. or something, they can look at the label next to it. Yeah. That's what the, the object's called, and then because they've got that, it tells them, oh, it's a text object, yeah. or it's a combo box, and they get a list of the things that they can do with that. Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense. The reason that I don't use it with Camera is that because in Camera you tell what are you, what you are going to do, and in page object model you do that as well. For example, if you have a search page, you will have like search for a valid text input, like input the text field with this data. So there are all methods, right? They all translate to Camera scenarios to me. So it's like find this object that's a scenario, and then I express my intent. In the given when dense. So adding this uh, second level of complexity of page objects doesn't seem too much necessary to me in this situation. Q can both affect sorry? Well. I'm sorry? Q can be itself. Is that English language? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. The main difficulty with this is it's at times uh, hard to put everything in given when then context. So you, you shouldn't be forcing yourself to use every time given when then. Like, for example, I call a service and then I expect a response, right? What's the given? Given there is a service. That doesn't make too much sense. When I call a service, then there's a response. Okay. Just, just you, yeah. I really do. do you have problems with, with we found problems when we're using Cucumber to get a specific sentence that can be matched to a step. If you're doing lots of similar things. Oh, that's an important click thing. Click the select yeah. button and there's six select buttons. Um, six actually, buttons. that's a difficulty. A lot of people, if you, if like, IntelliJ is good on that. It offers you, for example, if you start to say, I visit, then it gives you visit. Or just write visit. It gives you the available written functions, uh, but it again goes back to communication and reviews. If if people are reviewing your code and if you are communicating what you are doing, uh, testers should be able to know there are some functions that are already being used. And if they use IntelliJ again, it will suggest similar things very easily. So the, the suggestions come from anywhere. Don't because you, uh, no. when you write the, well, oh, yeah. I know in Java you can say, I only want it to look at the steps from this package. Right. Um, and then you can have three feature files that say, I click the select button. Yeah. And you can tell it, this one's looking at steps over here, this one's looking at steps over here. So they'll all do different things. If, if they are the same, uh, same sentence, they have to do the same thing. You can't have duplicates of so, step definitions. The way we use it is we have test runners, okay, and that's the the J unit bit. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that you run. You don't run the feature file; you run the okay. test runner, and that tells you that your step definitions are, are there. in a certain Java package. Mm. Okay, um, but IntelliJ doesn't seem to be able to tell you; doesn't link everything up. So when you when you've got these step definitions, it'll suggest it from everywhere rather than just the Okay, because because when I have these like test suite or functional tests different in a feature file, uh, features folder, I, I tend to use this project only for the tests, so I don't have the code from the production code in this project. So that way I, I know that if, if something is suggested to me, it's coming from my project only. Yeah, I, it's probably because of the, the size of the application. Maybe. It's, it's got yeah. hundreds and hundreds of pages yeah. in. 
yeah, I mean, quickly get it, it will. <laughs> if, if there are 100 pages, like really, uh, no matter what precautions that you take, there are, there are going to be duplicates, yeah. duplicates. But uh, this is just an expressive uh, thing, like, so what if there are duplicates? So what? Well, we have the, the trade off between do we write generic steps yeah. that everyone can use? So you say, I visit. Yeah. And then a yeah. regular expression to say the name of the page. <laughs> that, or do you write steps for each? I visit yeah. the but, search page. I yeah, but the then page. that leads to writing every action that you take separately. Like, for example, for login, you have to write, I visit this page and then I put in this field and then I put in uh, password and then I press so that's four steps already yeah. and then there's a then then there should be this five steps so I would just write when given I am on login page when I log in then I should see a welcome message so you can do that but but then you are losing the I don't know you are becoming not like you are not telling your behavior but you are telling your actions so i i want to avoid that as well yeah we had a sort of trade-off between we had some sort of shared steps so yeah. logging was a shit because everything started with yeah. logging in but then some of them we decided oh, actually no because then your feature files become very scripted and if you don't follow the right convention then mm. Uh, you don't, your test doesn't work. Mm. You have to write a separate step for it. And it was that trade off between should I be able to write freehand mm -hmm. what I'm thinking as I'm trying to express the test? Yeah. Or should I have to think about it and then translate it into the step yeah. syntax that is, has got a, a step definition behind yeah. it? Yeah, well, every every team is going to find what's best for them. So I'm I, I wouldn't be able to say what's the best way to do it. You have to really go in and see what's working for you. But it, it's always beneficial to keep in mind that like I don't know who maintained your feature files, devs or QAs or uh, we haven't really decided yet. We've only we've been using Cucumber for about three months. Okay, now, so, so if if you devs are initially because they can do the steps behind right. It. I would always prefer to educate the testers and then give them some technical abilities so that they can maintain. That, that's one of the reasons I use Ruby as well, because it's much easier to uh, learn and easier to maintain. So if they can write them themselves, it would be much uh, easier. Because you can test, think of some test cases that you want to test, but when it comes to uh, implementation, the things that you do can change. So testers mindset is very important to me. If the testers can do those writing writing process themselves, it would be much better and it would be it would free the devs the time that they would spend on writing those things. But they have to pair. Yeah. So people should be able to maintain and write the code as well. So again, the tests are not only the testers uh, responsibility, so the devs should be able to maintain them as well. So they have to be communicating, pairing. Yeah. Should I stop the recording now? Oops. First, I have to. All right. You know, but uh, please.